the bird was busted. She buried her nose in no man's land a half mile due west of where I went down. Wilson, the poor sap, didn't make it out. But that was his bad luck. I had more pressing problems. Hello, Warfighters! War is hell. Welcome to the next episode in the series where I'm playing Battlefield 1, but instead going to talk about the history of World War 1, so that way you guys can have a better experience while you're playing this game. Now, since I've been shot down for this mission, I figure who better than to talk about in this episode and dedicate it completely to his work and his conquest than Manfred von Richthofen, otherwise known as the Red Baron. So, here we go. Now, the Red Baron was named after a frozen pizza. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, seriously, like, this dude is legendary, okay? So, 80 air victories he was credited with during World War I. That's nuts to be able to think about. He was born May 2nd, 1892, to a prominent Prussian military family. Now, all males of the von Richthofen family were barons. The family was given that status by Frederick the Great in 1741, so he comes from a long line of aristocracy. Manfred von Richthofen began military training at the age of 11, which is nuts to think about. But that definitely ends up paying off when you take a look at the tactics and stuff that he implemented uh, throughout his career in the German military. Now, from a young age, Manfred von Richthofen ended up loving horse riding. And so he ended up joining the cavalry. This is one of the reasons why he ended up joining the cavalry prior to World War I. As we all know, cavalry units did not do well during World War I. The fact that there were machine guns and the tactics had changed tremendously really made cavalry units almost useless. And so his unit was dismounted and uh, Manfred von Richthofen was relegated to sending messages as a runner and also operating field telephones. It's weird to think. Later on, he was transferred to the supply corps of the army, but since this dude was a warrior at heart, he wasn't happy with where he was. He had seen aircraft behind their lines, and he wanted to fly them. That's the kind of combat he wanted to be a part of. This dude was ballsy. He ended up sending a message to HQ requesting a transfer that said, I have not gone to war in order to collect cheese and eggs, but for another purpose. Obviously, of course, meaning he wanted to fight. So his request was granted, and he ended up joining the German Flying Service in 1915. When he did join, though, he was just an observer in a reconnaissance plane. He was responsible for documenting enemy positions, taking pictures. It's a lot of what these observers ended up doing. Now, it is said, though, that while he was an observer, he ended up shooting down and attacking French aircraft with his observer's machine gun that he had in that plane. Now, this was a battle that took place over French lines, and since the French aircraft that he shot down ended up falling behind enemy lines, the kill couldn't be confirmed, and so it's not counted towards his score. He did start training as a pilot in October 1915, and what I found was that when he started, he was a below average pilot. He struggled to control his aircraft, and he even crashed his airplane during his first flight at the controls, which is also nuts to be able to think. But obviously, the Red Baron gets better at flying and shoots down another aircraft, but same story with this one. He doesn't get credit for it because he wasn't able to get it confirmed. So there's a guy who's pretty legendary, in addition to, of course, the Red Baron, uh, in the German air service named Oswald Bolke. Now, this guy quite literally wrote the book on how to dogfight. Uh, the tactics that he used were used by some of the most successful pilots. Now... Manfred von Richthofen ended up meeting Bulky earlier in the war, but he meets him again in August 1916. And the Red Baron just admired this guy so much. I mean, he was a legend, and uh, German newspapers, all that stuff would talk about what this guy was doing, and uh, the Red Baron wanted to be like this guy. Now, Bulky was visiting the Eastern Front, which is where uh, von Richthofen was at the time. He was looking for candidates to join a newly formed fighter unit. Like, this was one of the first units that were dedicated specifically to air-to-air -to -air combat. After talking with the Red Baron, he saw this guy's potential and his willingness uh, to fight and offered him a position in that fighter squadron known as Yasta II. And so from very early on, Richthofen has a tremendous mentor to teach him 
how to fly in the air and how so how to fight in the air too. Not too soon after he ended up joining Yasta 2, it's September 17th, 1916, we see the Red Baron finally get his first confirmed kill. He ends up getting behind this British aircraft and uh, ends up shooting it. And when it's damaged, the crane's engine and propeller ends up stopping. And that forces the pilot in this British aircraft to land at a nearby German airfield since he obviously wasn't going to get back to his own lines. Von Richthofen lands right next to it, finds the observer dead and the pilot mortally wounded. He ensures, though, that these guys end up getting a proper military burial. And there's actually a really cool article about uh, the first, uh, the person who was the Red Baron's first kill. Now, he ends up starting a tradition after this first kill, where he ends up purchasing glasses that are made out of silver, and engraved in these glasses is details on the kill, such as the date, stuff like that. He keeps doing this with every single kill that he has until the silver shortage of World War I ends up making this uh, impossible to do. So he stops at 60 kills. So he feels that this is a great way to uh, memorialize those who he ended up shooting down. There was a very interesting um, relationship that pilots had on opposite finest. sides of World but War I, you know, that they had with each other, which I'll kind of talk about more in the next the video, way. but I mean, they saw each other as aviators first and enemy second. So that kind of brotherhood here was one of the reasons why he felt like he needed to do this. October 28, 1916, the Red Baron is absolutely traumatized when he sees his mentor, Oswald Bolke, die. He wasn't in a blaze of glory necessarily, but he ended up uh, being part of a mid-air collision with another one of his own pilots. Now, this is devastating to a lot of people, obviously von Richthofen, but also a lot of people in the German army because again this guy was a legend and all of his victories were published this guy had 40 kills at the time and so uh, he was the leading pilot with him out of action the Germans needed somebody else to be able to fill that void and they turned to Manfred von Richthofen to be somebody that people could look to for success and to build morale his reputation advanced further though on November 23rd, 1916, when he downed British ace Major Hawker. Now, to kind of show the type of respect that they had for each other on opposite sides, Richthofen called this guy the British Bulky. Like, he had that much uh, respect for him that he associated him with his own mentor. Now, Hawker was in a plane that wasn't as capable as von Richthofen's. It was actually a pusher uh, plane. The, instead of the propeller being on the front, it was actually midway uh, on the plane, but the propeller was behind the pilot, so it would push it rather than, you know, pull it like most do. And so Von Richthofen thought that this was going to be a pretty easy kill, but because he put up a tremendous fight, it teaches Von Richthofen a very important lesson that, well, yes, the machine that they're flying in is important, but what is more important is the pilot behind the controls. And that pilot can really make the difference in combat, and he kind of motivated him to even be a better pilot than he already was. He had some great mentorship from... Uh, from Bulky, but you know he endeavored to be better anytime he could. January 1917 rolls around, and the Red Baron is on his 16th confirmed kill. He's put in charge of his own squadron called Yasta 11, and Yasta 11 was basically a bunch of misfits, is the best way to put it. They old, they had old planes that were just outdated. They had no kills to their name, and he felt a lot of pressure to be able to turn these guys around, uh, partly because of you know, the uh, notoriety he had. He turned them into being one of the most feared squadrons in the war. One of the things that he did to try and inspire his men and also to strike fear in his enemies, he painted his, or he painted his plane bright red, or sometimes it wasn't quite that bright. Sometimes it was a more crimson, but anyway, his plane was uh, often red. So the enemy would always know it was him who they were fighting. And so uh, out of trying to look out for their boss. <laughs> the rest of the squadron also painted their planes red uh, just so that way he wouldn't be singled out in combat because there is a lot of propaganda that was going around by Germany that even went so far as to say, and sometimes the Red Baron believe this too, that whoever shot down the Red Baron, if they were British, would automatically get a victorious cross, uh, that there were squadrons that were put together specifically to try the, to take this guy down. And so... 
uh, his squadron wanted to look out for him and make sure that didn't happen. German command did not like that they painted their planes red because it made it a lot easier for the enemy to be able to gather intelligence as far as where he was and where their squadron was operating, but they didn't really do do too much to stop him because it was one of those things that was really cool to be able to say. I mean, this is where he earns his name, the Red Baron, is because of you know the planes that he would fly were most often red. So after the success that he has, he's put in charge of a larger unit, which is basically a, uh, an air wing. And they continue on with the tradition of bright, uh, bright colors on their planes. So because their airplanes are bright colored and since they were very mobile, they used tents, trains, and caravans to be able to get around from airfield to airfield. And so this unit ended up earning the name affectionately the Flying Circus. Now these guys were really good. They especially stood out in April 1917 in a month that's called Bloody April. Now it was called Bloody April because the Allies were losing so many pilots and aircraft. And in that one month, his unit ended up downing a staggering number of enemy planes and pilots. If I remember correctly, I want to say it's nearly 50% of all of the aircraft that are shot down, uh, allied aircraft that are shot down. Von Richthofen, however, downs 22 British aircraft in that one month. Four of them were in one day. Remember, it takes five confirmed kills to be listed as an ace, so he almost earned, you know, being an ace in a day if he didn't have any more kills prior to that. But 22 in one single month. That's ridiculous. So, not too soon after that, we're in July of 1917, specifically July 6th. The Red Baron is chasing down an observation plane. And the observer in the back, remember, they have the machine guns, uh, you know, in uh, the dual aircraft usually. Or dual pilot, or you know what I mean. Pl aircraft that are manned by two people. There we go. And this observer was shooting frantically at the Red Baron. They were outside the effective range of the machine gun, but just call it spray and pray. One bullet from that machine gun ended up hitting Von Richthofen in the head. And him being wounded like that ended up causing him to pass out. Fortunately for the Red Baron, though, he ended up waking up just in time to get out of a spin before he ended up crashing to the ground. Now, after he was wounded, Germans were absolutely worried that the same thing was going to happen to him as it, you know, did to Bulky, that he was going to end up dying, and they'd rather keep him alive for the morale that he ends up causing than having him try and get more kills at this point. And so they offer him a position on the ground. So he ends up declining that position, though, and he refers back to the infantry who are in the trenches, basically saying that those who are in the trenches still have to do their duty when they're wounded, and so... He would continue to fly as well. Even though he was, you know, been hit in the head, he still continues to take down enemy aircraft. Now, nearly a year later, just a few months shy of a year later, it's April 21st, 1918, he committed a rookie mistake. He was flying really low trying to take out a plane. He was so focused on taking out this one plane. Now, flying low just isn't good. Basically, one of the things that uh, he would teach his own guys and also uh, was taught by Bulky. This was one of the things that he would teach everybody is that having the higher altitude always granted you superiority in dogfighting because you could just come down uh, at faster speed or you could just hit them from above. Now, he was flying pretty low, focused on this one thing. And there's a lot of debate as to who ended up firing the bullet that killed him, if it was a pilot or if it was an Australian machine gunner on the ground. But... He did end up dying, and in his last seconds, he was still able to make a hard landing in the field. Once he landed, his plane was ripped apart by people who were just wanting souvenirs, but um, the pilot who was credited with shooting him down had him buried with full military honors, and the British even had a wreath there that said, to our gallant and worthy foe. There's a lot of debate also about why he ended up crashing and why he ended up going against everything that he knew. One of the things that I found that I thought was probably most accurate was just significant brain damage from his wound. But that is the Red Baron. I'm going to leave it right here. Cool stuff. So make sure you guys subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow me on Facebook by searching War is Hell Gaming. You can follow me on Twitter at underscore War is Hell. And also donate to the Patreon if you guys can as well. That should all be in the description. Thanks for watching. War is hell, but you don't have to worry because war fighters, I've got your six.
Nelson said I was a no good, lying son of a bitch. I brought him home because I think he's probably right. And I hate that fact more than I can tell you. This guy's a bloody hero. No, he's nothing of the sort. He's a cheat, a thief, and a liar. And he'll answer for his crimes. That's right. 